everyone! This is Professor M. Das Science, and today we will discuss how to write 2x2 two two matrices in terms of Pauli matrices in another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. The states and operators of quantum mechanics are described using a vector space that we call the state space. While many quantum problems require the use of infinite dimensional state spaces, simple two-dimensional state spaces are also very important. They are required for the description of any two-state quantum system. And perhaps the most famous of all is that of spin one-half particles like the electron. But there are actually many more because two-state systems play a key role in many areas of physics, from quantum computing all the way to particle physics. Associated phenomena have also received a lot of attention, for example, the case of Rabi oscillations. Quantum operators associated with two-state systems can be written in terms of two by two matrices. In this video, we're going to introduce a very convenient way of writing two by two matrices, which is going to greatly simplify our study of two state systems. Specifically, we're going to demonstrate that any two by two matrix can be written in terms of the identity matrix and the three Pauli matrices. So let's go. Let's start with the two by two identity matrix. Let's also write down the Pauli matrices, starting with sigma 1, then sigma 2, and then sigma 3. In today's video, we will use these four matrices as a basis to represent general 2x2 two two matrices. And when we do that, the identity matrix is typically called the zeroth Pauli matrix, and we can label it with a sigma 0. Moving forward, I will assume that you're comfortable with the properties of the Pauli matrices, and you can find all the details in the video that is linked below. Right, so consider a general complex 2x2 two two matrix A, with matrix elements A11, A12, A21, and A22. In the most general case, these matrix elements will be complex numbers. Today's video is really simple. We're going to show that we can write any 2x2 two two matrix A in a unique manner in terms of the identity matrix and the Pauli matrices. And specifically, we will show that we can write A as a linear combination of these four matrices where the expansion coefficients d mu are in general complex numbers. Using the explicit form of the matrices, we get the A matrix equal to D0 times the identity matrix plus D1 times the sigma 1 Pauli matrix plus D2 times the sigma 2 Pauli matrix plus D3 times the sigma 3 Pauli matrix. And we can combine these four terms into one. First, note that the only two terms contributing to the diagonal elements are the term proportional to the identity matrix and the term proportional to the sigma 3 matrix. They lead to these two diagonal terms. We also see that the off-diagonal contributions come from the sigma 1 and the sigma 2 matrices, and we get these two off-diagonal terms. Comparing the original expression for A on the left here with this final expression on the right here, we can write down the conditions that the expansion coefficients d must obey for this expansion to work. And these are the conditions that the diagonal elements must obey, while these are the conditions that the off-diagonal elements must obey. So, what we need to do is to show that it is indeed possible to write down any complex 2x2 two two matrix as a linear combination of the identity and Pauli matrices as shown in here. To put it another way, we need to show that the identity matrix together with the three Pauli matrices form a basis in the space of complex 2x2 two two matrices. So how do we show that these four matrices do indeed form a basis? We need to show two things. First, we need to show that these four matrices are linearly independent. 
Second, we need to show that we can write any complex 2 by 2 matrix as a linear combination of these four matrices. So let's start with the first condition. To show that a collection of elements of a general vector space, such as our four matrices, are linearly independent, we need to consider their linear combination, giving the zero element. These elements are linearly independent if this equation can only be satisfied by d mu equal to zero for all mu. Conceptually, these elements are linearly independent if we cannot write any of them in terms of the others. If you remember this result from your linear algebra course, great! If not, I've included a link in the description to the corresponding Wikipedia page so you can convince yourself of this statement. In our case, we have that the linear combination of the identity and Pauli matrices can be explicitly written like this. And the linearly independence condition is such that this equals the zero matrix. Comparing the diagonal terms here and here gives these two equations. From the second equation, we conclude that d0 equals d3, and then from the first equation, we can conclude that they are both equal to zero. Moving to the off-diagonal terms here and here gives these two equations, and adding these two equations gives 2d1 equals to zero, which implies that d1 is equal to zero. And subtracting the two equations gives that minus 2i d2 equals to zero, which implies that d2 is equal to zero. So overall, we see that the only linear combination that gives the zero matrix is one for which all of d0, d1, d2, and d3 are zero, which proves that the identity matrix and the three Pauli matrices are linearly independent. We've now proved the first condition here to demonstrate that these four matrices form a basis for the space of complex two by two matrices. So let's now consider the second condition. We need to show that any matrix A can be written as a linear combination of the identity matrix and the three Pauli matrices as shown here. Remember also that we can write this down explicitly as the matrix A having to be equal to this combined matrix in terms of the expansion coefficients d. All we need to do now is to show that for any possible values of the A matrix elements, we can find four expansion coefficients d. Comparing the diagonal terms here and here gives these two equations. Adding them together gives A11 plus A22 equal to 2d0. This implies that d0 is equal to 1 half times a11 plus a22. Subtracting them gives this equation, which implies that d3 is equal to 1 half times a11 minus a22. Now, moving to the off diagonal terms here and here gives these two equations. Adding the two equations gives a12 plus a21 equal to 2d1. This result implies that d1 is equal to 1 half times a12 plus a21. Subtracting them gives this equation. This implies that d2 is equal to i over 2 times a12 minus a21. And that's it. For any matrix A, we can write it as a linear combination of the identity matrix and of Pauli matrices by choosing the expansion coefficients using these four expressions for d0 here, d1 here, d2 here, and d3 here. In the most general case, these d expansion coefficients are complex numbers. We've now also proved the second condition here, 
And therefore, we can conclude that these four matrices do indeed form a basis for this space of complex 2x2 two two matrices. And this result is extremely useful, because it turns out that the Pauli matrices are a very convenient set of matrices to work with in many quantum problems involving a two-dimensional state space, with perhaps the most famous example being the description of the spin angular momentum in spin one-half particles like the electron. We can formulate any operator acting on a two-dimensional state space as a complex 2x2 two two matrix, and a very important family of operators within these is those associated with physical observables. We know that these observables are described by a very specific class of operators, namely by Hermitian operators. And remember that a Hermitian operator A is such that it is equal to its adjoint. We're now going to explore what this implies for the matrix formation in terms of the identity matrix and the Pauli matrices. Let's write down the adjoint of the matrix A, and explicitly it's given by calculating the transpose of A and then evaluating its complex conjugate. This reduces to these matrix elements. For a Hermitian matrix, this must be equal to the original matrix A which in terms of matrix elements is equal to this. Comparing the diagonal terms, we see that the complex conjugate of A11 equals A11, which we can write down explicitly. And we also see that the complex conjugate of A22 equals A22, which again we can write down explicitly. These imply that for a Hermitian matrix, the diagonal elements must be real numbers. Moving on to the off-diagonal terms, we can compare this entry with this entry, which implies that A21 and A12 are complex conjugates of each other for a Hermitian matrix. The second pair of off-diagonal terms leads to the same conclusion. So overall, we have that for a general Hermitian matrix A, the matrix elements are such that the diagonal entries are real, and the off-diagonal entries are complex conjugates of each other. Right, so what do these results imply for the expansion coefficients d when we want to write the Hermitian A matrix in the basis of the identity plus Pauli matrices? Let's start with d0, which remember is equal to this expression. As A11 and A22 are real, that means that the expansion coefficient D0 is also real. In a similar way, we have that D3 is equal to this expression, and therefore D3 is also real. For D1, we have this expression. And using the fact that A12 is equal to the complex conjugate of A21, we can rewrite it like this. And remember that the sum of a complex number with its complex conjugate is equal to two times its real part. This means that we end up with d1 equal to the real part of a21. In turn, this means that d1 is also a real number. Finally, we have this expression for d2. Again, using the relation between a12 and its complex conjugate, we can rewrite it like this. Remember that the difference of a complex number and its complex conjugate is proportional to its imaginary part, so that we end up with this. This implies that d2 is a real number. And what does all of this mean? In the first part of this video, we've shown that we can write any complex 2x2 two two matrix A in terms of the identity matrix plus the Pauli matrices. In this general case, the expansion coefficients d are complex numbers. What we've now shown is that if we restrict our analysis to Hermitian 2x2 two two matrices, then the expansion coefficients d all become real numbers. As real numbers are easier to work with than complex numbers, this is an important simplification when considering Hermitian operators, and as Hermitian operators represent physical observables in quantum mechanics, you will find yourself using these results constantly.
Right, so time to summarize. We've shown that the identity matrix here, together with the Pauli matrices here and here and here, form a basis for the space of two by two complex matrices. To put it another way, we can write any two by two matrix A like this, an expansion in terms of the identity matrix and the three Pauli matrices. For a general complex matrix A, these expansion coefficients are complex numbers, and for our Hermitian matrix A, these expansion coefficients all become real numbers. We've shown that the identity matrix and the three Pauli matrices form a basis of the space of two by two matrices. You can find links in the description discussing the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a general two by two matrix. And you will also find several applications of two state quantum systems. I hope you liked the video and don't forget to subscribe.